Hello and welcome to Summit's Peak in a Pandemic webinar. I hope wherever everyone is that you're happy and you're healthy and you're staying well. My name is Martin Corcoran. I'm the Managing Director of Summit. We are Changemakers in Retail. So we have an absolutely fantastic session for you today. Should be about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, we have some brilliant guest speakers for you and some great content. So I think it's going to be a really interesting session, some great stuff, some really practical tips to learn how we can really maximize the opportunity of peak. Um, we are going to be answering questions as we go. So there is a Q&A chat box at the bottom of the, of the screen. Please drop your questions in and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible. OK, on with the show. So quick recap of our agenda. So uh, as I said, my name is Martin Cork. I'm the Managing Director of Summit Media. We're a performance marketing and e-commerce agency. Um, and I'm going to lift the bonnet on some of the insights and data that, that is really driving our decision making um, and give you a flavor of how that's helping us plan for our retail partners. Then we're joined by Lisa Hooker and Jacqueline Windsor, both partners at PwC, um, who will be sharing um, some, some the latest round of data in terms of consumer confidence and sentiment and give us a, a helicopter view of, of retail at the moment, um, which should be really fantastic. And then finally, we're going to have a bit of a chat with Mona Nikazad, who's head of e-commerce from Organics. Uh, very recently, Organics have launched through the e-commerce channel, and there's some absolutely fantastic insights in that story as well. So um, we will, we're really looking forward to getting into that with you, Mona. Okay, so if we'd have had this webinar in 2019, I would have been able to come here and say, look, e-commerce is no longer a nice to have in the market. It's a must have. And everyone who signed up would have inevitably agreed and said, absolutely. It's gone even further by 2020. E-commerce is no longer a must have to complement your core business. E-commerce is going to be your core business. It's already the primary marketing channel for acquiring and retaining your customers. And for many verticals in retail, it's going to be the primary sales channel also very shortly. So it really, really is a pivotal moment in retail with the decline of the high street and the acceleration of online. Many, many retailers are talking about the need to transform and pivot their business. And the principle of transformation has led us to the, the idea that we want to put on a series of webinars that, that really empower retailers, brands and our, our, our agency peers give them all the information that they need so that they can make the biggest and best decisions to help push through to the other side, push through to be a digital first business. So today we're really lucky. We've got some great guest speakers. We're going to be talking about how we can, we can maximize the opportunity of peak and use peak and the golden quarter as a springboard to accelerate that transformation. Up and coming next month, we have um, how to recession proof your sales plan. And we're going to be joined by Amit Agnariti, who's head of analytics at eBay. They're going to be sat on a wealth of data there, and it's going to be really, really interesting. And then following that in December, we're going to be focusing on technology and how you can innovate and reinvent and make sure that you really are ready to springboard and take advantage of all the opportunities that, that we will have through Peak and get off to a flying start in 2021. So for those of you who are less familiar with Summit, I thought I would just share a little bit of detail. So we are 20 years old. It's our birthday this year. It's our 20th birthday this year. We are experts in e-commerce and performance marketing and have long-standing client relationships with the likes of Reckitt Benkiza, Jules and 3Mobile. Um, we develop all our own technology in-house and we have our own proprietary marketing intelligence platform, which is called Forecaster, which is proven to drive more sales for less cost. And most importantly, it's agnostic of channels. So it sits above advertising platforms. It's not dedicated to a single advertising platform. And it is all about identifying where and when to spend your money to get the greatest return. And since 2018, Summit have helped deliver more than £1 billion of sales to UK retail. So I think considering our, our history and the war stories we've got, as well as our influence in terms of the sheer volume of sales, 
we feel we're in a really privileged position and and we might even be described as a, a as an influencer within retail and we want to start to try and shape and influence retail so that I say our retailers, our brands and our, our peers can start to accelerate and, and continue the growth of, of e-commerce as we go. So before we get into a bit of detail, I just wanted to lift the bonnet on some of the data and some of the insights that are really driving the decision making for myself and my colleagues at Summit and really helping us with our client partners win. So what is the data that is driving our decision making and, and, and leading to our strategy and our plans and tactics with our retailers helping them grow in this space? So we have a, a quote and it's actually written on the wall of our offices. So the future is only a surprise to those who fail to observe the past. And when you consider the dramatically changing landscape of performance marketing, it's really, really important to understand those changes and use the trends to try to drive through the strategy for the next year, three years, five years. So one of those trends that we have observed that is driving our strategy is the fact that Google's uh, share of ad spend is down by 34% in the last five years. OK, so those retailers, those brands who are heavily, heavily invested in Google, we need to be able to have um, technology and strategies that actually lift us up. So we're able to take advantage of multiple advertising platforms. And it isn't just Google that needs to be focused on. Aligned to that, we're seeing share of sales attributed to social channels doubling every year. And they're now worth 10 percent of those online sales. And we know that there is a behemoth in Facebook, which has reached maturity and has pretty stable growth. But much of that, that influential growth in recent years is being driven by the likes of TikTok and Instagram, who are seeing exponential growth in terms of the number of users to their platform and the available audiences. And that is having a knock on impact in terms of how social can be used to influence customers, can be used as a performance marketing channel and can be used to drive more sales. And finally, we've observed that channels managed in combination deliver 35% more sales than channels managed in isolation. So the whole performance of these channels is greater than the individual sum of the parts. So we need a helicopter view. We need to elevate those channels. We need to be thinking about search, affiliates, social, and display as one performance marketing proposition that complement one another. And if we're able to do that, and we have partnerships and technologies and plans that enable us to bring those things together, then you do get more bang for your marketing buck. So that has been driving our long term strategy in terms of marketing. But in the immediacy faced with peak, we know that that COVID has had a really, really strong impact at specific category levels. So we've used our marketing intelligence platform forecaster to understand the historical changes in customer demand and predict what is likely to happen over the course of the next two or three months. So there will be winning categories. There will be categories that have been changed, of which there are more customers and new customers in the market this peak than we might have expected or had previously last year or, or, or earlier in the year. So there are new customers to go at. And in terms of those categories where we're seeing a long-term behavioral change, craft is one of those that is driving up, up to 69%, 70% growth through peak. Uh, we know that's likely driven by customers more likely to stay at home and other entertainment channels being shut off to them. Um, and so we're seeing a significant trend in terms of craft. Another one to take note is bikes, a really, really interesting category where there's been a sustained behavioral change. And we can say that because of two reasons. We can say that because customers no longer feel as confident as they did in terms of public transport. So bikes as a mode of transport is growing significantly. And also we know that there are significant health benefits to getting out there and exercising. So, you know, bikes is a really good representative of a category that we're seeing a whole new demographic and a whole new group of audiences coming in, buying and engaging that we might not have seen had we not been in the middle of this pandemic. 
Conversely, there will be categories that are suffering. There will be categories where customers are feeling less pressure and less need to buy into those categories and therefore are likely to, to divert and spend their money in alternative places. You know, again, we've, we've ranked across the whole breadth of the categories and we've just pulled out some interesting ones for you here. But, but travel goods is one that is very clearly suffering right now, whether that's health and beauty or whether that's luggage. Actually, customers are more likely to stay at home, less likely to travel, and therefore the need to go and buy those products has diminished. You know, there are some very obvious ones in there as well, such as business wear, party, um, and, and even automotive, which has seen a significant recovery as we came out of lockdown. But again, the, the you know, link to the traveling piece, we're expecting uh, uh, that particular vertical to have some, some challenges and some headwinds. So at a category level, we're able to identify the ones where there are more customers, the ones where there are less customers. And we should be heroing those categories and we should be watching those categories in terms of our marketing investment and strategies. But at a macro level, what we're seeing is, is significantly more demand. OK, so more customers in the e-commerce market coming and shopping online. So the graph you're seeing over on the left, the, the Y index is demand. By that, it means the total number of customers in the market searching for products that, that are being sold. OK, and then the X axis is our peak time period. And what you'll see is gray is last year. The gray line is last year. And the red dotted line is what we expect to happen in peak 2020. So when we deep dive that, we're actually expecting the e-commerce channel, we're expecting it to grow by 30% as a minimum in, in peak 2020. So we're expecting more customers shopping through the online channel, but we're also expecting those customers to start to shop earlier. So it's going to be a bigger peak and it's going to be an earlier peak. And it's going to be an earlier peak as a result of certain things like Amazon Prime Day, which has happened this week. Um, customer concerns over stock, customer concerns over delivery, the end of the furlough scheme, which will be replaced by the, the, the job support scheme, which is a, a less rich version and therefore could have an impact on consumer confidence. And luckily, we're, we're, we're going to be joined by... Um, Jacqueline and Lisa later, who have some fantastic data in terms of consumer confidence and sentiment um, and, and is really going to be insightful in terms of helping you drive your strategies for growth. So an earlier peak and a larger peak. From a, a, a customer perspective, Summit went out and asked 500 customers to start to get a sense of how their behavior is going to be changed as a result of COVID and the knock-on effects in terms of, of, of being locked down and social distancing and so forth. And what we can say is 36% of, of the customers who, who we surveyed said that, that they used to shop exclusively in store, but now they will shop online. So there will be a 36% bump in terms of the number of customers who will now be shopping through the online channel. OK, and that's one of the data points that has been fed in in terms of our prediction in terms of the growth of, of online year on year. The next thing to observe is more than 50% of customers responded, stated that they had already started their Christmas shopping prior to October. And that is up 20% year on year. And again, that's another really relevant and, and, and practical stat in terms of enabling us to say it is going to happen earlier than, than, than it would have previously. Peak and the golden quarter is going bigger and it's going earlier. And finally, 65% of customers have the same or more budget than last year. And you know, as we were preparing the content and myself, Mono and Lisa and Jacqueline, you know, we were discussing how we wanted to, to pitch this. There are inevitably significant economic concerns out there, really significant economic concerns. But if we if we keep our eyes on the prize and we think about the channel that we're most interested in, that you're most interested in, that being e-commerce, e-commerce is going to boom. It is e-commerce is likely to grow at 30 to 50 percent. And there are plenty of customers in the market who, who have more money than they might have previously because they've not been able to spend. And, you know, they they're going to be ready to shop. So, yes, there is some concerns in the market, but also there is great opportunity. 
So as I bring that back and I, you know, if I can leave you with four things before I hand over to our fantastic speakers from PwC. First thing would be every brand and retailer and agency out there should be planning for a 50% growth in e-commerce. Now, we may not achieve the 50% growth, but what we don't want to do is leave any sales on the table. So we are expecting a significant number of customers to come in who wouldn't have shopped through this channel. So when it comes to resources, budgets, logistics, everything like that, we need to make sure everything is in place to try and grab as big a share of that 50% growth as possible. We need to use the breadth of digital marketing channels, uh, uh, marketing channels and sales channels together in combination, making sure that we are, are making sure that that budget is getting maximum bang for buck and the channels are complementing one another. We need to hero certain categories, hero certain products. And I think it's really worth saying we need to make sure that, that, that we are responsive to the performance of those categories. So, you know, it, yes, we need to know how much we would like to spend in those categories, but really there might be more opportunities than we plan for. And so we should continue to spend and, and drive the sales in those chat categories provided we're getting the, the performance and the returns. And it should be the performance and the returns that drive the strategy. And finally, um, go early, go now in driving sales. Uh, and I know this is probably not what a lot of retailers want to hear, um, but, but we don't make the rules. A number of factors, both external and within our own industry, mean that, that customers are coming to the market earlier. So if you're not already at full speed, you should do everything you can to get up to full speed as fast as possible. Do not delay. Do not wait for, for the start or middle of November to build for Black Friday. There is a peak and it is already arrived. So we need to make sure that we are maximizing that opportunity. Okay. So we, we will distribute those uh, points and, and some content at the end. And now we, I'm really lucky to invite three fantastic guest speakers to join us. So first of all, we have Lisa Hooker from uh, uh, Consumer Markets at PwC. We also have Jacqueline Windsor, uh, partner and strategy at PwC, and they're going to take you through some of the latest data from PwC. And they've got fantastic experience. And I can't wait to, to ask them some questions shortly. And then we're going to follow that with a bit of a fireside chat with Mona Nikazad, who is digital and e-commerce strategy uh, uh, organics. And they have a fantastic and really recent and relevant story. So with that, I'm going to turn my video off and I'm going to hand over to uh, Jacqueline and Lisa. Thank you, Martin. Hello, I'm Lisa. So Jack and I are going to cover the voice of the consumer and how they are feeling at the moment. Some reflections on interesting disruptive models and innovation, and then have some of our early observations around peak trading. So thinking about the consumer and how they're feeling. Since 2008, we've been asking the consumer, do you think you'll be worse or better off over the next 12 months? And using the balance of opinion of a, as a measure of consumer sentiment. It's interesting, coming out of the election, sort of December last year, we saw a bouncing consumer confidence. And then actually we saw it drop quite heavily in March when we went into lockdown. But the positive thing is it's back now to about neutral, not just a little bit below the post-election bound, um, which is so much better than we saw in the last global financial crisis. And what's actually quite important, this improvement we've seen more recently is across all age groups and all regions. And why is that? It's something that Martin said, over 60% of people said they've either been not financially effective or have more money because they've started saving obviously been helped by some of the government schemes, but also they've not been able to go on holiday and buy things that they may normally buy through this period. But looking forward, although people are quite optimistic, um, they are being quite cautious on what they spend their money on. Um, so it's not across the piece. And we regularly ask customers, you know, are you gonna spend more or less going forward? And if you look on the next slide, what the customer is saying to us is actually on most categories, we are going to spend less outside of those which probably are not unexpected. So the only area, areas they are expecting to spend more around the home, around well-being and around essential areas 
such as grocery. Um, I think what we will say is it's not all about COVID though. The home and nesting were already trends pre the pandemic as we downloaded and increasingly used food deliveries. And this trend has just accelerated through the lockdown. And whilst some home improvements have definitely seen a bounce, you know, if unemployment kicks in, it might mean that there's actually some of the big ticket does start to come off a little bit. So we just need to be a bit cautious of that. Now, looking at the next slide, what we've also looked at is what shopping behaviours will stick coming out of this pandemic. And what we show on the X axis is, is what behaviours have been happening through COVID and on the Y, what are likely to continue. Now, during the last global financial crisis, we really embraced shopping at discount chains and even being proud not to pop the bag into a posher bag as we walked away. And this stuck as we came out of the recession. So I think what we're expecting to see this time round is some behaviours such as socialising online, using house party Zoom, while a great success, are unlikely to continue to grow post the pandemic. While areas that we have started in lockdown that we do think will accelerate are buying from brands that do the right thing for both their customer and staff, and also making more use of small and independent shops, which could over time see a little bit of a revival in the high street. Now I'm going to hand over to Jack to just think a bit more about interesting and disruptive models. Thanks, Lisa. Of course, the other development that is going to really shape consumer markets is the level and pace of digital disruption. And as you can see from this page, it is influencing every consumer vertical that we touch, whether that is retail, food and beverage, media, and wider travel uh, situations. Um, and that has one clear implication. Consumer expectations are rising across any brands and retailers that they touch. And that landscape, if you like, is not staying still. There are a number of emerging business models that are entering the consumer repertoire. And as an example, we're looking at clothing and footwear on this page, going from left to right. I think direct to consumer started as direct to the consumer uh, standalone brands, it might be retailers of third party brands, and of course the marketplaces that we know, whether that's an ASOS or an Amazon. But I think increasingly there are alternatives, whether we think resale, like Real Real, rental, like Rent the Runway, and actually examples that's not on the page, whether it's a virtual wardrobe that we can buy and place on our avatars and social media. And I think there've been two responses to this development. One is around convergence, and second is around partnerships. So looking at convergence, how are incumbents responding to some of the latest trends? And again, looking at clothing, three examples to illustrate this point. ASOS in the first column started off as a, uh, a retailer of third-party brands, clearly then really expanded its own brand range, but more recently has launched two marketplace models one for boutique and independent brands, and second on resale. A second great example is Farfetch. So in the last 10 years or so, launched as a marketplace platform for independent boutiques, but has made a number of acquisitions of different business models, whether it's a resale platform like Stadium Goods, or actually brands themselves with the acquisition of New Guards Group, who owns brands like Off-White. And then finally, there's also a convergence of B2C and B2B. I think net porte Ux is a great example of that, where Ux not only has a customer fascia, but provides B2B offerings and white label e-commerce websites to smaller luxury brands. The second response is around partnerships across the end-to-end -end value chain, okay? Whether you're thinking from research, design, to make, sell, and fulfill. And I think there's some really interesting partnerships with brands and retailers that have illustrated the degree of partnerships across this space. So if you look at design, for example, Adidas is doing some really interesting uh, partnerships with brands that capitalize on consumer trends, whether it's Allbirds and sustainability, universal standard in terms of inclusive sizing, or something like Palace that gives them credibility for streetwear. 
but it's also the boring stuff, right? It's the back office that you need to compete in the omnichannel world. So that is around logistics and increasingly with third party uh, providers to be able to uh, deliver those capabilities. I think Deliveroo recently, particularly in the COVID um, period, really partnering with the discounters and grocers to add more things to that basket. So what does that mean for the people on this call? Okay, I think there are three big key success factors to order win on the digital channel. That is one is driving customer lifetime value. Second is winning in social. And third is getting a really optimized, optimal user experience online. So let's take those in turn. So customer dynamics, what do you need to get right? You need to understand who you serve. And that is segmentation outside of your standard profile. It's really unpacking how segments vary by attitude and usage. The second big thing is in that middle co column is really understanding what are the drivers of your economics, okay? Is it orders, frequency, or how much is put in their basket? And as a commercial <laughs> diligence advisor, I really like to see how those cohorts move over time, okay? Are they buying across categories? Are they buying more? Or in fact, are they actually returning for a repeat purchase? And then finally, my personal spell test, is around customer engagement, which you can absolutely measure. Whether they love you in terms of affinity, whether they buy you again and again, loyalty, and of course the holy grail, advocacy, and whether they promote you among their friends and family. The second key success factor, and increasingly so, is winning in the social arena, okay? So Gymshark is probably the best example of this, where their strength of their brand and their community okay, drove a 40 time multiple in their recent minority raise. Okay, but what does it take to win? And again, you can validate and quantify this across a number of categories, whether it's presence, okay, how um, active are you across platforms, it's activity, both the level, mix, and the speed at which you respond. Clearly, it's about execution and calls to action, but also it's about cross-platform coherence, okay? Because again, is it a really seamless customer experience no matter how they touch you? And then the final key success factor, I think in the digital space is how great your user experience is, okay? Across the journey from when a customer lands to how they transact and how they activate any help that might be required. I think for us personally, we see a lot of movement in the search and refinement space, the functionality to navigate what consumers want, how fast and easy you can check out in a secure way, but increasingly so around the community and social media element, okay? Trying to give a reason for consumers to visit again and again. I think looking forward, um, as Martin talked about, it's not an easy place to trade right now um, and think there's going to be a lot of pressure um, on consumer wallets, um, which will drive different dynamics in the market. The way we like to think about the recovery trajectory is by consumer category, because then there's a lot of noise around that average. And the five scenarios that we have identified are on the left-hand side, everything from accelerated growth to actually some sectors that are adversely impacted by major structural change. So let's just bring a couple of these examples to life. So I think accelerated growth, this is where demand has really surged during COVID and is likely to maintain momentum going forward. I think a really great example of that is meal delivery, okay? Whether it is the Uber Eats deliveries of the world, but actually it's how restaurants and B2B suppliers have had to pivot to B2C offerings in order to survive. I think the second great example is beauty and personal care in the middle row. I think there's some really different dynamics here. I think color cosmetics is down, maybe not a lot of uh, interest if you're not going out a lot, whether it's to work or socializing, giving lockdown restrictions, but also the rise of personal care, okay? It is around skincare, it is around self-care, but it's also around care of your family and indeed your pets. 
And I think on the last row, I think clothing and footwear is going to be fundamentally affected in a negative way as our priorities shift. Having said all of that, I think there are two things that uh, need to be overlaid. One is in every sector, online will win, okay? So Martin, prepare for that 50% uplift, absolutely on the money. And the second is there'll always be some subsegments that will uh, punch above its weight. So if you think of something like athleisure, okay, is clearly outperforming the wider clothing and footwear market. So Lisa, what can we expect in quarter four? Thanks, Jack. So I was asked to say, what do I think about peak trading? Because we're just starting into it. Um, on the positive, so I'd like to start on the positive. I've told you that consumer confidence has been strong and is strong, and it's often a good indicator of future spending. The other positive is retail sales have actually been above last year since June, um, which shows that people do want to spend. But unfortunately, I can't stay totally positive. People, economists who are cleverer than I are, are telling me their latest forecast, it will be down at Christmas between 3 and 6%. Whilst online will clearly win overall, if you're not just online, that there is underlying decline likely to come. And there will be real polarization between those who have and have not. And not unsurprisingly, why are they say it's going to reduce? Well, the impact of the restrictions and probably the more intimate gatherings. You might be really generous, but do you buy less presents when you don't actually see people because you can get away with it? And you have less reasons to dress up and spend money on going out. And there will be concerns about the job losses that are starting now to go up. The other thing we're thinking about, you can't talk about peak now without Black Friday. It's been here a while and it's now here to stay. The thing I will say about Black Friday this year, it's again late in the month. Now, when we were doing all our research on Black Friday, it was really interesting. It was all about yourself and buying for yourself before last year, particularly the men who really like to spend on technology. But last year, we started to see that they, they actually started to intrude on Christmas shopping because it was a, a week later, and it is so this year. So actually, it's going to have a more of an impact on Christmas particularly as people trying to spread their expenditure to try and help the supply chain and social distancing. The other thing which will make Black Friday even bigger is there's probably more innovation in tech this year, whether that's around the phone or around gaming. As Martin said, everyone is expecting people to be far more planned for this Christmas shopping. There are concerns because Asia went into lockdown in February that some products will run out. So people are buying earlier to spread the expenditure, to make sure they can get what they want. But also, people have got more time at home at the moment to plan. And I think you'll have all seen Christmas emails and Christmas shopping areas go up even earlier this year. Partly, actually, because things like Halloween are not going to be as big, so people have dedicated space over to Christmas. Interesting, it was mentioned about Amazon Prime Day. Um, and what we actually did see, everyone saying Amazon Prime Day was not actually as successful as people thought it would be, but it is starting to pull forward Christmas. Now, in terms of Christmas, we thought we'd also look back at last year. What did we see and what can we learn for this year? Last year, we saw a real focus on homeware and practical gifting, and we do think this will continue this year. We also talked about the five C's, about channel convenience that have been there for years, but more importantly about curation. People tell us they've got too much stuff to look at, so they want you to help them curate. It used to be online, it was all about where is my delivery? It's now about I can't find the stuff, so I'm gonna click off. So you need to make it easy for people to shop. It's what Martin and Jack said, it's about communication. Do not communicate where your customers were last year. You need to communicate where they are today. And credit is really coming to a fore. Thinking about how are you going to bring credit into your offering? We've all seen Klarna massively grow and we think that won't go away. The emerging trends as well for this year is about conscientious consumerism. We've already seen the rise of this. Um, consumers might not pay you more for it, but they will punish you if you aren't um, thinking about sustainability and being good to your, both your customer and your staff. And also we're going to see an increased use of local. 
And what will all this mean for January? Well, unfortunately, I think you do need to make sure you manage your stock levels before January because we think it will be a much more muted January sales period. So thank you for listening to Jack and I on some of our views around the consumer. We'll now pass back to Martin. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely fantastic. So hopefully you can stick around just for a couple of minutes because I've got a I've got a few questions that have come in. First one is actually my own question because I'm interested and I get to do that when you host the thing. Um, so what can we learn from the, the 2009 financial crisis that we can apply to, you know, we're already in recession and you're talking around a very muted January. What can we learn that we can apply to our future strategy? Um, I think from a consumer perspective, this concept of sticky behavior, I think is really rev- relevant, um, but it looks a bit different this time around because okay. fundamentally the triggers are different. In the last recession, it was an economic crisis. This time, at least initially, it was a movement restriction. So last time round, what was that sticky behavior? So when people were trying to navigate pressure on their wallets, they cut back. They traded down, they traded out, and they were much more promiscuous about the brands and retailers they shopped at. And when the economy recovered, that behavior stuck. This time around, as Lisa talked about, what has happened? I think for the benefit of all the people in the room, it was all about digitalization, right? But really importantly, in products and services that historically had a low online penetration, think food, think personal care, think household essentials, pharmacy, um, and wider social like house party, right? And that behavior will absolutely stick going forward. The other thing to a lesser extent was the preference for brands with purpose, right? Whether that's giving back to their employees, their customers, or their wider community. And again, maybe not necessarily as a premium, but certainly as a source of differentiation. Okay. Fantastic. And then uh, I also have another question from uh, Darren here, who's asking in terms of the consumer confidence, it's great to see it rebound and it's great to see it, you know, probably higher than we maybe thought it would be. Do you think this will continue through peak? I actually, I actually do think it will continue through peak because the next question we ask them after how confident you are um, is why are you so confident? Well, and it wasn't just about them having more money, but people were really quite confident. If they lose their job, they will get another job. So I actually think that the confidence will hold up. I think we will have a little bit of low lull. And the prediction is that we came into the year with unemployment at 3.7%. We're currently at 4.6. We'll probably get to nine. But by the end of next year, the expectation is we'll be back at 5%. We are going to have less people coming into the country because of Brexit. Um, But therefore, it means that people will struggle to fill some of those vacancies. So I think the job market will come back by the end of next year. Good. That's good news. Hey, good news for everyone. Okay, And and one final question before we have to move on. So in terms of the deals environment uh, right now, um, where and, and how are investors looking to shape those deals in retail? Actually, I'm, I'm a, I spend my life doing deals and everyone said to me, you must be quiet. And we're not. We've been really busy. It's fantastic. Is The market is very polarized. If you're a platform like a Gymshark that Jack and I worked on, if you're in growing segments like pet food, we've had two recent pet food deals like health and well-being, like home. If you're a brand like a Doc Martins doing incredibly well, um, or if you're in essentials like you've seen the recent Asda deal, there are plenty of deals going on. And the other thing is, if you are strong and have got money, it's the time to maybe think about consolidation. You look at Next buying um, Victoria's Secrets. I think that's great. You know, Victoria's Secrets pulled out of the UK. They're going to put it on their platform. You look at Boohoo buying Warehouse, Oasis, Karen Millen. So if you've got money and strength, it's the time to support some brands that still have a reason to be there. Absolutely. And I think from a from a performance marketing perspective, we'd say the same thing. Now is a great time to strengthen your brand as as other brands pull back and potentially try and spend less. And, you know, now is an opportunity to, to step forward and take a, a much bigger, better brand share. Um, so if you are in a strong position, definitely something to, to think about. OK, Jacqueline, Lisa, thank you. That was so, so interesting. And we really appreciate your thoughts and your, and your data and your insights. And we'll be able to share your, your pack at the end of this. And, and now I'm going to 
hopefully uh, have a bit of a chat with Mona. How are you doing, Mona? Yes, all good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem. No problem. I've got a, I've got a few questions. I'm just going to raise them. So for some of our audience who maybe don't know uh, enough about the, the organics brand, can you just give us a bit of background in terms of where you sell, who you sell to, what type of products and so forth? Sure. So Organics are the UK's number one baby and toddler snack brand. Um, we sell a whole range of foods, everything from cereals to puffs to biscuits to jars. Um, we, we do it all, really. Um, and we typically start from six months um, for little ones from six months. And we've got great distribution. So we're across all of the major retailers and also in the majority of convenience stores as well. Wow. Great stuff. And Organics recently made the decision to go to go DTC and go through the goal to start their e-commerce journey. Can you, can you tell us uh, what, you know, what triggered that? Yeah, so it's something we've wanted to do for a very, very long time in the business. And to be honest, I think there was a lot of fear behind making such a big move. How would we support it internally? Um, but Pre-COVID, we'd already decided that 2020 was the year that we'd go D2C. Um, we never envisaged that we'd launch in the midst of a pandemic. Um, but, I mean, there is a, a, a positive side, I suppose, to it in that there was more of a need um, for brands to be online and selling direct. So um, we would anticipated we'd probably launch in the summer and we brought that forward so that we could launch a bit earlier. So we launched at the end of May, early June. And... Um, and yeah, it was it was always something we wanted to do, but it was definitely accelerated with the pandemic. OK, fantastic. And did it change? Did it change your targets and your objectives? So obviously it accelerated it. But but were the you know, your end goal, was that the same or, or, or did that change? Yeah, so I was very reluctant to set very, very strict targets. Um, initially, when we positioned it to the business, it was a test and learn project for us. We wanted to see what we could do with it. And then. Um, and obviously we had to commit to some numbers, um, which we which we did. Um, and thankfully, because of COVID, we managed to achieve those and much more. So there were there were great targets to set pre-COVID. But um, but yeah, we we did set ourselves some sales targets for year one. Um and also a few KPIs around what we felt like it would do in terms of brand awareness and brand engagement and sentiment online. Um, so some very light KPIs, um, but yeah, thankfully, um, all so far is going well. Good. Well, that's great to hear. I'm, I'm sure there are many, many people sat in, in you know in similar shoes, but maybe they haven't had the, the opportunity to bring it to, to bear in terms of the e-commerce channel. So what advice would you give someone who's who's thinking about doing it now in terms of what they need to do and and also how they can influence maybe their boss to get the investment and get the support yeah well my my biggest piece of advice is just go for it honestly just do it I wish we launched sooner I wish we launched years ago um it's been the best decision the business has ever made um it was I don't know now why I look back and we feared it so much. I think e-com can be made extremely complicated. Um, there's a lot of data flying around. It seems like a very extremely um, heavy investment uh, financially, time, time-wise as well for staff. Um, but you can definitely go D to C on a budget. Um, we are proof of that. We managed to spin round our own store within six weeks. Um, we launched for under 10K. Um, so you can definitely do things both on a financial, but also a time-wise um, budget. So definitely just go for it. Um, and for anyone that's trying to get some investment or sponsorship within within the business, I would say put together a very light presentation, go to the people that hold the purse strings and talk about, you know, what the trends are. I mean, the ladies have just presented some amazing stats on, you know, what's set to grow. You've talked about e-com growing 50% next year. It's all going online. And I think sometimes the business needs some someone to put all that together, take them with the cold hard facts, um, and take ownership in terms of who can who can launch and support it for the brands. Okay, so you you had a six week time frame and you had a ten k budget. Are you are you still working to very short time frames and very small budgets, or has the case been proven now and and there is there's more investment coming in? Yeah, so certainly for 2021, we've managed to secure much more budget, um, which is great. Um, and we'll always, I think the nature of how everything is at the moment, 
we'll always be working to tight deadlines. Um, but thankfully, there are so many great partners out there, great tools out there. You can do things really quickly. You can test and learn, fail fast if necessary, and just move on. So yeah, unfortunately, time restraints that always will be uh, will be there. But um, now that we've launched, we can see that it's um, you know doing well and making good money for us. Um, it's you know open that appetite for the business to further invest. Great. And what what do you think will be the big bets for you next year? So for us, it's all around online exclusives. Um, that's what we are um, focusing all of our energy on. So things like online exclusive bundles, value packs, personalization. Um, it's about what you can get from us that you can't get from anywhere else. Um, so for us, that's that's the main thing that we really want to grow and develop on our channel. Fantastic. And I can't I can't have you on a peak webinar and not talk a little bit about peak. So is peak is peak a thing for organics? Are you engaging? Are you looking to capture more customers? Yeah, absolutely. For us, it's all about acquisition and driving those incremental sales. Um, so of course that's that's our main objective. So this this is presumably the first e-commerce peak for organics. Yeah. Um, can you give the guys some some you know or, or attendees just a little overview in terms of how you'll be applying the marketing channels and driving that acquisition? Yeah, so it's very much a, a marketing mix for us. And um, again, talk, going back to what you were mentioning before, it's not one channel in isolation for us. We're across everywhere, um, whether it's programmatic, social our own website search has been key for us um, we know typically with our audience as well that um, you know mums and dads they they start researching earlier than they are going to be actually be, be a customer for us and they they go to google that's where we need to be that's where we need to be appearing and have the great visibility um, so for us we require all of the channels across um across advertisement to make sure that we are we get great brand awareness and strong visibility Okay, Mona, Mona, thank you so much. That was so, so valuable in terms of your experiences. And I think you've debunked some myths there in terms of, you know, going online has to be really convoluted, really complex and really expensive. You know, I loved your comments around test and learn, move fast. You can do it for under 10 grand, you know, build the business case. There'll be so many people who are watching this webinar who will be absolutely inspired by your story. I'm fairly sure you're going to be inundated either, <laughs> either on LinkedIn or, or via other channels after this but it was really really great speaking to you and uh, hopefully we get a chance to have a speak again absolutely Thanks, okay man. all right right i'm just going to change and get the powerpoint back up so if everyone can just bear with me one moment um okay so before we finish up, I just want to, to, to let everyone know. So everyone attending the webinar today will be uh, in a competition on behalf of Summit. So we're offering £5,000 worth of performance marketing support across our product caster platform, which is um, the biggest comparison shopping site, independent comp uh, comparison shopping site in Europe. So we're offering a, three, a free three-month subscription. We're also offering a free performance marketing channel review, traditionally worth £3,000, and then uh, a free day of consultancy from one of our senior client managers and client directors to make sure that you really get, get the benefit. So we'll be in touch and we'll let you know who, who is our lucky winner on that front. And then just a final reminder, we have two more webinars coming up, one next month in terms of helping retailers think and get ahead of the, the, the principles of recession. How do you recession proof your plan to make sure that you're not one of the casualties? And then finally, in December, we'll be bringing a webinar on the best practice and the best pieces of technology that can really help our retailers and brands accelerate that digital transformation. We've got fantastic guest speakers soon to be announced. So please go on, sign up for them now. Um, we'd really, really love to have you. So that just leaves me to say um, a big thank you to everyone who, who has participated. So Mona, thank you very much. Jacqueline, Lisa, thank you so much. Really great insights. Um, also, our Summit's very own Nick Neves, who's been absolutely fabulous in terms of pulling this together with, with Katie De La Cruz at the Street Agency, who've helped us do all of this. So to all those people, thank you very much. I hope you found this as insightful and as practical as I did. Uh, and I hope you go on to have a great rest of the week and an absolutely amazing peak. Okay, thanks.
Bye-bye.